Our first speaker up is Rachel Kelly, an operations engineer. Did I get that right? Yep, from Portland. Uh, please make her feel welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Rachel Kelly. I am an operations engineer at a small healthcare startup in Portland, Oregon, in the US. Um, I would love it if you wanted to use my Twitter handle if you tag me into comments about the talk. Uh, it is whole milk up there. Uh, it is on every slide. Uh, I'd also like to give you a brief map to my talk. Um, you will see the seed, the flower, and the fruit uh, on every slide. And at each act, uh, that area will be highlighted. So you will know just where we are uh, at every part, part in the talk. Uh, first, some disclaimers about backups. Uh, this is not a prescriptive talk. Uh, this is a what we have done talk. Uh, we have made lo lots of mistakes, um, <laughs> but we've had lots of wins, which even for our most dire moments, I will try to highlight uh, throughout the talk. Um, I am about four years into my operations career. Uh, my, my background and my training has been fairly old school, uh, with the exception of, uh, of using a lot of Amazon Web Services. Uh, that's, that is the cloud component of everything that we do at BrightMD. That is my company. Not that most folks would know it. But. Um, however, all those disclaimers aside, uh, I really want to know how you do backups. I have this pet theory that very few people use enterprise solutions for backups. Uh, I personally know no one in my uh, operations network that does use an enterprise solution. Uh, so if you do, please uh, come talk with me about that. Um, and I want to know whatever homebrew way that you have put it together as well. Um, I, uh, I love it. <laughs> uh, and I will make some time at the end for us all to, to talk about how we do backups. Um, so, uh, our, our acts of, of this talk, uh, first we're going to make sure that we're all on the same page with the terms uh, that I'm going to be using. Uh, if, I, if I do use a, a term that is unfamiliar to, to me, um, please, uh, this, is the only, this is the only time that this is okay, please raise your hand and I would love to explain it to make sure that we bring everybody with us. Um, I know that folks at this conference are uh, a bit more advanced than, than maybe other operations conferences I've been to, but still I, I do want to make sure that we, that we bring everyone along. Um, act two is the really fun part, uh, the, the horror stories and the uh, recoveries that, that we made. Um, and then finally, act three is, is going to be what's next, what I would really love to do um, if, uh, if I could just spend all my time on this. Um, so, uh, again, for our shared definitions, uh, these, these may be obvious to you, uh, but if you know all of these, I invite you to take this time to uh, draft an email thanking the people that introduced you to these ideas. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, first we've got Bash, which is both a, a scripting language and the um, entry language to most Linuxes. Uh, Personally, I interchange server, box, and instance uh, during this talk. Uh, that isn't strictly true everywhere, but it will be true for this talk. Um, Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, servers that we don't physically manage. I know cloud is, is nothing new to folks in this audience. Um, uh, Git is just one system to track changes in your code or in your infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, simple storage service, AWS S3, uh, can be thought of as a file system with no server to back it up, uh, just a place to put things. Um, uh, EFS, or Elastic File System, is AWS's response to NFS, Network File System. Um, NFS, briefly, is a file system that multiple servers connect to with ease. Uh, and the appeal of EFS on AWS is that you don't need to pre-allot your disk space. So you can hook it up and use as much as you want, um, uh, which is, of course, a, a serious departure from classical hard disks. Um, 
uh, a cron job will take a time and day and execute a small bit of bash. Uh, you know, often if that gets more complex, you you will ask it to call a larger script rather than you know cramming in you know 80 lines of stuff just in the job itself. Uh, and finally, AWS Glacier uh, holds data for long-term storage uh, coming from S3. So I know it's a lot of AWS, uh, but that, that, is where, that is where much of my job lives. So, uh, so uh, let's also come to a shared definition of what a backup is. Uh, is it a complete copy of the file system? Uh, sometimes, if you need that, um, including, you know, proc and dev and everything that it's was really just for the box itself, nothing to do with any application that you put on it. Uh, or is it just system logs? Or is it just application logs? Um, is it just a diff of the previous day's backups, uh, known as a partial diff? Uh, and is it also CYA? Uh, it is all of these and more. Um, the definition that I prefer here um, is a way to retrieve information from a previous state. A pile of data meaningful in the context of your servers and your organization. So why do we take backups? Uh, my industry, as I said, is healthcare. Uh, the primary piece of legislation that, that uh, we are beholden to is HIPAA. Um, uh, the Healthcare Insurance Portability, not Privacy, <laughs> and Accountability Act in the United States. Um, uh, HIPAA was created to resolve this issue of, of every single healthcare system having their own uh, medical record system, some digitized, some not. Uh, it, it was initially created to give patients more power to bring their data with them as they go. And that is sort of true, uh, but we have, we have a lot of walled gardens in front of us, uh, which, which really, unfortunately, is not true to the, to the really noble spirit that was the initial writing of HIPAA. Um, uh, Title II of HIPAA dictates management of, of personal, personally identifying information and personal health information, heretofore, heretofore called PII and PHI. Um, and your regulations on that are very much best effort when it comes to the auditors. Um, but we, we just do our best. Um, the, the newest version of that um, in the US is something called High Trust. It probably stands for something, but it's you know, just a, a giant long acronym. Um, uh, but it is very prescriptive rather than HIPAA, which is um, very descriptive, I guess you would say. Um, so, but once you have it, then people who partner with you know exactly what your security footprint looks like. So it can be very valuable, but of course, significantly harder to get. Uh, uh, then there's PCI DSS for payment processing. We, uh, we outsource our payment processing to another company, so we luckily don't have yet another piece of, of regulation to comply with. Uh, and then finally, um, just like Karen was saying yesterday in her wonderful talk, uh, GDPR has elevated the state of security all over the world. Uh, because if you, if you have a customer that, that is even a citizen of the EU, your entire organization's security uh, strategy needs to adapt for that. Uh, and that has just been such a, such a huge win for consumers and for healthcare patients. Uh, so now I will tell you uh, what we have done. Um, so uh, I like the word historicity a lot. It's sort of like the meta context of the history itself. So of course we have our story and then we have the placement of that path in historical context. We came to this journey of backups in the context of our company, my background, and countless other factors. Uh, none of this that you see was inevitable. All of these were choices that we made in the context uh, where they were made. Uh, so in August of 2017, uh, we found a bug, as you often do, uh, and they asked ops to uh, go check out how many times this had happened uh, in our logs. Uh, However, because of extremely busy log rotation uh, and putting, at that time, 
we've learned so many lessons from, from these uh, stories, I will tell you. And at that time, we put every single uh, data point from the application into one log. Uh, so it, you know, we, we ended up like blowing through our logs, you know, uh, 11 files of it that would rotate out into the ether, never to be recovered, um, every two weeks. So, uh, so first we tried to, but, but we said, okay, great, we, we have backups. Uh, we, we know that they are taken every night, that they, that they do work, that they are real. So we tried to restore a partial backup. Um, but at least in the time that I had been there, which at this time was about a year and a half, um, we had never taken a full backup. <laughs> Uh, so I think that you can think of it like gets deltas. Uh, what is a partial? What is a delta without the context? Of course, because we never took the, the full backup, we, we couldn't get anything. Uh, and it was um, scary. <laughs> uh, so we failed to restore the partial backup. And we could not give <clears throat> any more data on this bug than extrapolation. We had some guesses as to when it was introduced. And that was all. Um, However, I do want to highlight that the big win of our first try at backups was that they were created every night. God knows what those partials actually were, but they were absolutely consistent every night. Uh, <laughs> you know, silver linings if you can. Uh, so we couldn't make Dupli work. Uh, Dupli and duplicity were what we were using previously, um, and I, I mucked around with those for a bit uh, and, and just couldn't, couldn't make them, of course we couldn't get the partial backup, so we, we couldn't make them work and we needed to move on to a, a functional solution as soon as possible. This was a compliance nightmare immediately in our backyard. Um, uh, so we needed to get a real solution up as quickly as possible. Um, so this was, this was creating a tarball of just about the entire file system, uh, uploading it to Amazon S3 uh, uh, with a daily cron job. Uh, this was very urgently done, like think an afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and it was not um, baked into any of our infrastructure because we just needed it up immediately. Uh, uh, however, um, it didn't reliably send to S3, and we still have not figured out why this happened. Uh, you'll see how we resolve this later, but, uh, but it wouldn't send reliably to S3, so it would fill up our tiny disks, because I'm sure, as you know, uh, you know we don't keep massive uh, hard disks on our application servers. We just keep what we need, because you know, that disk cost, can cost quite a bit of money. Um, uh, so, <laughs> because our disks were filling up all the time, we, we had a few outages which were totally preventable and frustrating. Uh, so then we got in the habit, the wonderful habit, of just doing tons of manual checking and it was, it was very frustrating. Um, however, we were mostly back in compliance. Uh, they worked and we could get them out again. <laughs> we could find information from them again for the first time really since the, the start of when we had attempted to install backups. Um, uh, finally, um, after, after building new instances, uh, as, as at the time of, our, of my organization, uh, we did every few months, uh, we had no backups on the new systems because they were not integrated into our infrastructure process. Uh, and I personally had just built uh, our databases uh, with EFS and getting them off of the primary application disk. Uh, for, for us, that worked really well. Our, our databases don't get that big. Maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 gigs at most. The data that we deal with is relatively manageable and small, which is uh, nice. Um, and I, I had really enjoyed working with it. It seemed like a, like a neat tool. Um, uh, so I rebuilt our uh, backup system. Th this was the first one that I had a hand in from start to finish. Uh, so I rebuilt our backup system uh, rather than sending to S3 to just tar up the file system on the connected uh, Elastic File System disk. Um, so 
so I estimated um, with the with the amount that was sent every night from each of our servers, which is I don't know between 30 and 50 at this time, I believe. Um, that we would increase our spend, certainly, uh, by about five to $7,000 for the year. Uh, not a small amount, um, but acceptable because it really would bring us into compliance. Uh, I guess you don't have the larger picture of what we spend, but, um, uh, but unfortunately, I miscalculated, um, as probably many people in this room also have, I hope, maybe it's just me, uh, and it ended up costing us about that a month, about five more grand a month, and that is unacceptable. <laughs> um, but we did have the eight weeks of backups. Um, they were entirely reliable. They were immediately retrievable. They were incorporated into the infrastructure build. Uh, so they worked, they were just very expensive, but at least we got here. We were completely in compliance. We could get every piece of information that we had put, put there, which for me felt like a huge deal. And my boss is saying, we need something cheaper immediately. And I'm like, okay, but look. <laughs> uh, so an alternative title to this talk <laughs> that I think is really funny is how to save your uh, company $30,000 in one year. The answer to that is, whoops, we are on track to spend 30 un totally unnecessarily $1,000 per year. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we came back to the Tarball to S3 solution. However, this time we integrated it into the infrastructure build. Uh, S3, as you may or may not know, is very inexpensive. Uh, it, it might be a hundredth of the gigabyte cost of EFS. Um, and there are, some, there are some reasons that EFS is a lot more expensive. Um, First, uh, it appears to be local to your file system where it's mounted. It's not, do not be fooled. It is not at all local. It is, it is still network file system. And of course, everything is abstracted with AWS, but it's, it's not a local disk. So you are, so they are baking in the cost of that transport uh, into the cost of EFS. Um, uh, not, having decide, not having to decide how much space you need initially uh, means that they can charge you a premium for it. Do yourself a favor and figure out how much disk you need. Just do a little napkin math at least. <laughs> Don't just say, just give me the everything because you will, you will pay for it. Uh, and furthermore, unrelated to cost, and this became a, a, a big issue once we discovered this, um, EFS is not encrypted by default. So not only is this disk not local, uh, that transport of that data is not encrypted as it goes to EFS. Uh, so that, that totally destroys our compliance, um, uh, which was very frustrating. <laughs> uh, we also reevaluated what all we needed to have stored and tarred up and sent to S3, uh, because at the, when I had made the EFS solution previously, um, we, uh, uh, we found that, that it was a lot more expensive than we had imagined. Um, so, so there was no need to send lib files. There's no need to send stuff like dev or proc. Um, uh, or dependencies for the package. <clears throat> when a new box is created, the, the application dependencies can manage themselves. We, we don't need to step in there. Um, uh, and finally, to, to solve the, the weird issue of S3 not always um, grabbing the, the tarball that we send it, uh, we just have it look for anything that is in the to be sent directory. That's a simple solution, but it made a big difference for the reliability of our, of our backups. Um, uh, so, uh, what is our complete backup solution? Uh, each night, a cron job calls a bash script. Uh, I was talking with someone else and, uh, and he said, oh man, I, I made my own backups and it's just bash. And I'm like, that's okay, man, me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, 
so the script has some setup pieces, uh, including some safeties. Uh, this set EUO pipe fail, I'm sure if you write some bash, you are familiar with this. Uh, but set E and set O pipe fail mean that the script will stop if any command fails, whether inside of a single line or just a line itself. Uh, and then set U means that the script won't run if they're unassigned or unused variables. So really handy for, because as you, as you may know, uh, Bash can be a very unsafe language. Uh, so these, these bring that down just a little bit to a little bit more safety. Um, uh, so first we tar up the file system with some exclusions in an exclude file, and you can just pass that to the tar command with a capital X, which is really nice. Uh, and then we send it up to S3. Um, uh, prefixed with each host's host name. So it's pretty simple, but we know we can find whatever we need. Uh, and after uh, 56 days in S3, the tarball is sent to AWS Glacier, the long-term data store, uh, so that only the last eight weeks is readily accessible in S3. Uh, and uh, finally, there is a restore script to get a file or a directory out and put it in the current working directory. Um, and it works. It all works. It's cheap. Uh, it happens every night. It's not too nasty to maintain. It's a couple of bash scripts, one of which only gets used when you need to pull something out, which so far has happened a few times. And it just works flawlessly and cheaply. Uh, the, uh, the restore script uh, at this time uses the Amazon credentials of the current instance. Uh, so you cannot get other instances backups with this tool. Uh, this was initially intended, and I'm sure that some bells are ringing for you, and that's great, but this was initially intended as a security measure. Uh, uh, and speaking of this, I, I really would like to make this much better. Um, so what is next? So as I said at the beginning, I could work on this, I think, forever, and they'll never be perfect. Uh, but here are some of the things that I would really love to do next. Uh, uh, so first, I'd like to uh, create a, a great script of some kind uh, to restore to a brand new instance altogether. So we've determined that we don't need dependencies, uh, dependency files. Um, we can let you know Node and pip manage whatever they need, uh, and that's totally fine if we keep things predictable enough. I know that you know things happen, but but mostly we we ought to be able to rely on that. Uh, and put the, the partners uh, config their custom stuff on a newly provisioned box. Um, and at this time, we, could, but we can only get files from the box that they came from, uh, which brings me to my next point. Um, I'd like to be able to get these from anywhere, not anywhere, anywhere, but many anywheres. Uh, so the restore script gets environment variables from the local environment. So I'd like to generalize those in a safe way um, and you should be able to get these backups from any authorized operator's own machine in the right uh, network or VPN. Um, it's important to take as much work off of these production boxes as we possibly can. Uh, while I initially made it so that you could only get the backups from the machine that they came from, um, we, we really need to, to peel out our forensics from the actual function of the instances. Um, uh, that said, making the machines accessible from more places will require further access controls and safeties in other places. Um, and uh, as as we as my as our business uh, progresses, uh, we are introducing more and more microservices in at a slow rate. But we we don't have a, a solid backups process for those yet because all of these uh, services look a little bit different. Uh, the the servers that they're on are different. They're, of course their their function are, are their functions are all different. Um, so we need some kind of uh, generalized process for those. And as you may guess, uh, this is just a matter of time. We are getting there with this one. Um, 
and I would like to write a better command line tool. Uh, personally, I really enjoy writing wrappers around AWS APIs. Um, I find that the returns are pretty consistent, and I know just how to find whatever I need on their documentation. Um, oh, I love good docs, and I feel like the AWS docs are just like to the moon. Um, and uh, finally, I really would like to write something with a lot more uh, safety. Um, we, we have introduced some safeties into Bash, but really it, it can be a very shoot yourself in the foot tool. Uh, and my, my background is Python, uh, so I'd really like to rewrite the whole thing in Python, um, although it feels less Strangely, it feels less native to me than Bash, which is a sentence I never thought I would say in a million years. <laughs> uh, but Python has pretty good libraries for interacting with AWS APIs, so, so that's what I would love to do. Um, and, uh, and again, the data is glacierized after eight weeks in S3, um, and for now we hold on to it forever. I want a retention policy. <laughs> I want a, a way uh, to say we are going to delete all this data after a year. Um, uh, and we also, the other thing about this is we have not gotten any of the glaciered data out yet. Uh, so I would love to write a little tool for querying and getting what is in the glacierized data. Right now everything is sent up in tarballs, so that query would be probably weird. We'd probably need to sort of change the kind of data that we send up to S3 that, get, that then gets glacierized. Um, uh, so there would be a lot, of, a lot of interesting problems to solve, I think, with this one, but I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, in summary, I'd like to be able to, you know, in the event of catastrophic failure, which we're always thinking about in operations, um, restore to an entirely new instance, uh, get the backups uh, from anywhere with authorization and safety, uh, get backups going for our increasing uh, field of microservices, um, make better CLI tools for uh, all of these backups, excuse me, and write some tools for Glacier data extraction. But finally, what I really want is to pay someone 10 or 15 grand a year for a real enterprise solution. We have spent countless money and woman hours on developing these solutions, and they work, and that's awesome. I don't know what the total of my time for this uh, will end up having cost. Quite a lot. Um, uh, not invented here is a nasty habit, uh, one that we all need to uh, be a little less okay with. Like, oh, well, I'd like to sort of experiment with this tool. Like, stop. We need to have the most reliable and best solution for our organization, not the most interesting one. <laughs> um, I personally talked with a couple vendors at AWS reInvent a, a couple months ago, and um, and one solution was just like enormous, and then, the, and then another one, I'm still talking with the person, so it may end up that that vendor could be a good, good fit for us. I'm still not convinced that there is a, a good, limited uh, backup solution that I could just pay for and turn on and forget about. Uh, so until then, you know, Tarball to S3 works. Um, I just really don't know why there doesn't seem to be uh, an end-to-end -end enterprise backup solution that is simple and monopurpose. I, I have seen, again, a number of vendors that just want to expand their scope to the moon, and that's, that's not what I need, and I'm not gonna you know, start off my relationship with you by giving you $150,000 a year, like that's, and that's not what a, a company of 50 people is ever gonna do. Surely there is something beneath that that we could talk about. Uh, so, for this Q&A, uh, I am inviting, in fact, only comments, which I know is uh, super funny, <laughs> uh, taking a page from Katie's book. Um, I invite you to tell me about your backups solution. Um, uh, <laughs> um, 
and I am literally going to write it down to uh, look into later. You have two minutes at the microphone, at which point our dear Tom will cut you off. I'll probably cut you off faster than that. See if you can like fit it into a tweet or two. Um, at, my, at my company, we rely quite a lot on uh, snapshots, on Amazon snapshots. And then for all of the desktop machines, we just use Backblaze. For all of our sort of workstations, for all of our developer machines, Backblaze, a couple bucks a month, problem solved. They're not. So I'm going to answer the question because I was the person who put my hand up. <laughs> uh, so at my current work, I would we use NetBackup, which I would not recommend because it costs a fortune. In a past life, I've used Amanda. Amanda's a really good open source backup system. It's got a commercial variant with paid support and a really nice management dashboard. And these days, it will back up directly to S3. Mm -hmm. You put an agent on all the systems. You can easily pull individual files back, either from the CLI or from the web UI. Um, works really, really well. It takes a little bit of tinkering to get set up initially, sure. um, but it's very solid, very reliable. I've used it at like newspapers, places like that. OK. Uh, how, uh, many, how many servers do you back up with that? Um, in the past, dozens. OK. So that's, probably that's the right sort of scale. scale so, OK, yeah, yeah. cool. Thank you. Uh, I don't do this, but a friend of mine does in a small startup, which is the restore part of the backups, which is the most important part. Um, every morning they populate their staging environment from an anonymized production backup. So if the backups fail, they know immediately without having to go, have we checked the alerts, have we checked this? The developers will know, the admins will know. So that's just one tactic that they use. Thank you. Hi, this is going to be a little bit self-serving, but I actually work for a backup software vendor. Cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you for coming to my yeah. <laughs> amateur-ass talk about it. Um, yeah, so I work for a startup here in Christchurch. We develop backup software. It's OEM, so if anyone in this room wants to start your own backup service, you can use our software to do it. So you just rebrand it as your own and start selling it. But we connect to S3 and everything. The big difference, I guess, compared to your solution as ours is deduplicating, so you can... Um, right now you're storing, you know, every, every tarball is going to have a lot of similarities. I know you didn't quite manage to get the duplicity patching stuff working, but um, it, it is possible to save money with um, DGP and also cheaper storage. Wasabi in particular is compatible with the S3 API and all tools that use S3. But what, it's what is compatible with S3? Wa wasabi, it's like oh, an S3, you. it's a service, but it's, it's cheaper than S3 with the same functionality, basically. Okay, cool, thank yep. you. The company that he just said. The company that he just said for the recording is Comet Backup. Katie. Hi, I'm Katie, and I've used an enterprise backup solution. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure whether that's is that. Just yeah, get it's in on? there. Yeah. Um, it was for a Windows system, but it was called Retrospect. And it was very good because you could do your limitations and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it would back it up in a great big blob. And those okay. blobs would be stored on a Windows file system. And that's not exactly useful when you want to make sure that you have, say, redundancy in your backup. So we ended up creating a cron job that asks sync stuff <laughs> off-site. Yeah. So even with these uh, enterprise solutions, there is still some bash. Uh-huh, sure. So, yeah. Cool. Happy to chat. Later. Awesome. Thank you. That was retrospect. Uh, you may also want to look at TarSnap. It's Tar, but it sends your backups off to S3 I and it does local Tarsnap. encryption and deduplication. I personally use Bacula, and everything that was said about Amanda, you can say about Bacula as well. Mm -hmm. Is that B A C K U L A? Uh, there's no K. Okay. Like Scott Bacala. We just use our snapshot of the critical bits to uh, a VPS in another state. Okay. Uh, plus some scripting to dump databases into a readable format at a transaction level before doing the backup. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just give you a quick summary of a horror story we had with Glacier. Okay. So we had big tar files of uh, effectively what backups and then we needed a file or a selection of files from each of them. So effectively we had to pull down 
every single tar file instead of just one or two. Oh. And that costs a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so be very careful of placing. Thank you. Uh, who was next? Oh, good reach. We unfortunately use an enterprise solution. It works great. Uh -huh. um, it's called Veeam, but it works great for VMware systems, not cloud. I see. So as okay. we move to the cloud, we're looking for something new. Veeam does have a client-based solution where you put your agent on the systems, uh, but it doesn't scale in the same way that you want it to. So we're looking at Borg Backup, uh -huh. which is another open source one uh, that does the dedupes. Um, Bo poor backup? Borg, B-O-R-G. Thank you. Um, oh, bo oh, yes, I've heard of yeah. Borg, yeah. So that's what we're looking at. Snapshots aren't backups, whoever said they were. Um, they're great as a primary quick restore, but you need something else that's cold. Right. So we had much the same problem as, uh, as Simon. We had big tar files, and mm -hmm. uh, we also inherited a customer that used Baros, which I think is a bacula fork. Mm -hmm. um, and the same problem, we need a file. You know, you're waiting like hours sometimes to actually get to the point in the file where you find the one, you know, config file you need. So we switched to a, an rsync solution onto ZFS. Sure. And then we just ZFS send things mm -hmm. um, to like encrypted loopback images on VPSs, you know, on cheap storage elsewhere. So mm -hmm. to get the offsite replication happening. And because it's encrypted, it's completely. rsync to ZFS. It was rsync to ZFS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are using Solaris as, uh, as the ZFS node for okay. maturity reasons, unfortunately. I actually wanted to mention uh, a security aspect of backups. Mm -hmm. Whatever solution you use, uh, always ask your vendor or ask yourself if you implement your own solution. What happens if your production server is compromised? Mm -hmm. Can the bad guys delete your backups? And the other question is, what if your laptop is compromised? Can the bad guys use credentials from that laptop, get to the backups and destroy them? Make sure that cannot happen. Don't trust yourself, don't trust your production machines. And that makes a, a great point. We, we've recently moved away, um, Tom, will you grab that back? Uh, we have recently moved away from credentials per machine, and now we group them instead with IAM groups. Um, uh, again, another AWS-specific tool for permissions. Hey, um, great talk, thanks. Um, so um, a lot of people are talking about their works backups. Make sure you back up your own stuff too. Um, don't lose all your personal, personal photos backups. and things. Yeah, yeah, what do you use? Um, so for my personal stuff, I'm using Dupli and Duplicity. Okay. Um, running on AWS EC2 into S3 into Glacier. Um, I recently then stuffed up how I was storing my images and decided to put them in S3 and lost a bunch of them consequently. So I had to restore from Glacier. Um, what was that like? the costs of what that's going to be. It didn't end up working out as expensive as I'd feared. Yeah. But... It well, you can do add, it slowly, right? And it won't take like too much It still does time. cost more if you're willing. It's cheaper if you're willing to wait longer for them to send you the files. Right. Um, and if you want them like in an hour or something like that, they charge you a lot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, do that math if you think that <laughs> might be a thing you want. But also it might mean that you don't have to store eight weeks in S3. Okay. If yeah. the cost is low enough that you could say, well, we're unlikely to need the one from eight weeks ago or four weeks ago. It's just my English laptop. Quicker. So, yeah. 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 Cool. cool. So you use Dupli and Duplicity on your own. That's great. Thank yep. you. Hi. Yeah, we use our step search for offsite backups, mm -hmm. and it works great. Thank you. Our step. Our snapshot. Oh, our snapshot. Got it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Rob, my personal note taker. Thank you. Am I right in remembering that our snapshot is the one that sort of tries to act like time machine? Yeah, it does hard. It does hard links of copies of files. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah, we've got about five minutes, so I'm okay to keep sort of sharing stories until that time. Okay, um, having um, dealt with a number of clients with horror stories, um, the main thing I would say is probably have two or three backup regimes. Keep something local on a uh -huh. spare disk. Keep something remote and you need something else as well because often the remote one doesn't work. I hear a lot of people relying on Amazon Web Services. Well, what if they're down? Right. Um, It'll happen. And so the uh, third one I'd probably recommend is get a big uh, external USB drive and back up to that and take it home. Well, I mean, all of our instances are in the cloud too. 
Yeah. Like that, that doesn't that doesn't quite work for us. I, I still I still do take your point though that we need to have them duplicated elsewhere. And at this time, we have a second region yeah. that we copy everything to for another S3 bucket. Um, that still it still feels like more servers I don't have access to. You know, but it's it is better than than not having that. But well, I do take your point. I, I guess the point I'm just making is don't rely on one backup regime. Sure. It's, because uh, An excellent point. there's a lot of stories out of the Christchurch earthquakes <laughs> on this point. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and when uh, S3 went down in US East 1 a couple of years ago. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, one more. Oh, yeah. One, Sorry. Mo one more comment to the previous one. Uh, we just do some simple modular in that just send that back up to uh, different cloud providers uh, every other day, like every. The, Every yeah. machine got a different routine, mm -hmm. but obviously one day is like provider A, B, another day is provider B, and so on. So the, the backups are spread across, uh, at the moment, I believe, three cloud providers. So okay. in case one is down, we still got backups. Maybe not the last one, because that one might be down, but it's somewhere. Excellent. Thank you. I feel like this is the kind of conversation that would lead to a whole lunchtime full of war stories and <laughs> heartbreak yeah. and and commiserations. We could have we could turn this into a whole group healing session. Um, in fact, in fact, I want to find the people who said Bacula was good, and I want to cry on their shoulders because <laughs> Bacula was 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 the bane of my life for years. So I'd love to see how you made it ever restore. Um, but we are out of time, so. Um, Thank you very much, Rachel, and um, everyone give her a round of Thanks, applause. Thanks, everybody.